This uh, panel is called, it's, a, it's also an artist spotlight as well. Amelia Bears, Winger Bearskin and Jason Edward Lewis on AI art and the Seneca creation story. And this story, this in particular session is about how arts are engaging with world making possibilities of AI. How might indigenous or global perspectives on AI propose alternative technological visions for the future? This spotlight takes us well beyond the familiar extremes of utopian techno solutionism or techno apocalyptic or even techno more expansive data sets to, to consider indigenous ep epistemologies and new models for AI. I'm gonna introduce the two moderators today. We have uh, Lauren Lee McCarthy, who is not, this is not a description, who is our current high visiting artist, who's been so generous in visiting with so many parties and different people across the campus and we're so lucky to have her and her work here. She's an artist examining social relationships in the midst of surveillance, automation, and algorithmic living. Her performances have ranged from serving as a human Alexa, controlling people's homes, to providing an IRL follower service, to offering herself as a surrogate, remotely monitored and controlled by parents whose baby she is carrying. She's the creator of P5, an open source uh, creative coding platform that prioritizes inclusion and access, as I mentioned, is our visiting artist this year, and also a professor at UCLA in the Design Media Arts and Disability Studies departments. And then our next, they're not the next, they're doing this in a, in a collaboration. Sriniza Srinivasan is a co-founder of Louvre, a developing music venture designed to demonstrate how commerce and technology can be guided by artistic values rather than letting our culture be led by market values. Her career began in AI as an ontological engineer at the sick? Psych, sorry, Psych Project, a pioneering effort to build an immense database of common sense knowledge, and she went on to a long tenure at Yahoo, from their fifth employee and self-titled ontological Yahoo to vice president, editor-in-chief of the global company. She now serves as a vice chair of Stanford University's Board of Trustees and as a member of High's Advisory Council and as a board member of the On Being Project. Thank you. Hi, I'm so um, happy and honored to be here to introduce our two featured artists. I'm gonna start with Jason, and then I'll introduce Amelia, and then Amelia will um, begin the presentations. Um, so Jason Edward Lewis is a digital media theorist, poet, and software designer. He founded OBX Laboratory for Experimental Media, where he conducts research, creation projects, exploring computation as a creative and cultural material. Lewis is deeply committed to developing intriguing new forms of expression by working on conceptual, critical, creative, and technical levels simultaneously. He's the University Research Chair in Computational Media and the Indigenous Future Imaginary, as well as Professor of Co Computation Arts at Concordia University. He also directs the Initiative for Indigenous Futures and co-directs the Indigenous Futures Research Center, the Indigenous Protocol and AI Workshops, the Aboriginal Territories and Cyberspace Research Network, and the Skins Workshop on Aboriginal Storytelling and Video Game Design. His work has been featured in Ars Electronica, Mobile Fest, Electra, Urban Screens, Isaiah, Sigraph, File, and the Hawaiian International Film Festival, among many others. And he's been recognized with the inaugural Robert Coover Award for Best Work of Electronic Literature, two pre Ars Electronica, Honorable Mentions, several Imagine Native Best New Media Awards, and multiple solo exhibitions. And Amelia Winger Bearskin is an artist who empowers people to leverage bleeding edge technology to affect positive change in the world. She's an innovation fellow at the Land Acknowledgement Lab for the US Department of Arts and Culture, Honor Native Land Initiative. She's the Banks Family Endowed Chair of AI and the Arts, Digital Worlds Institute at the University of Florida, and the founding director of the AI Climate Justice Lab. In 2022, she was awarded a MacArthur Foundation Award as part of her Sundance AOP Fellowship cohort for her project Cloud World, Sky World, which was part of the Whitney's Sunrise Sunset series. In 2021, she was a fellow at Stanford as their artist um, and technologist in residence made possible by the made possible by the Stanford Visiting Artist Fund in honor of Roberta Bowman Denning. Um, and in 2020, she founded Wamp Wampum Codes, an award-winning podcast and an ethical framework for software development based on indigenous values of co-creation while uh, 
working as a Mozilla Fellow at the MIT Co-Creation Studio. So one thing that really excites me about um, both of these artists is they have such diverse practices and they're often working in so many different places with so many different people. And I think that the things that they learn um, from all these different positions that they take really, in my view, inform their work. And so I'm really excited to hear from them today. I'm short. I'm shorter than you are, Lauren. I'm bringing it down, the mic down, my voice up. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you to all of the organizers. This has been an amazing event. Can we clap? Is that okay? <laughs> I'm like, I love clapping. It gets the energy up in a room, and um, I'm just really thankful and honored to be here. Nyaweskano, uh, thank you, and I'm glad that you're well. So thank you to everyone for having me, um, and thank you for Lauren for introducing me. Um, one of my favorite people, everyone here on this panel, actually, some of my favorite people. So um, today I'm going to show you some images from my artwork while I'm talking to you about AI and creation stories. Um, but I'm not actually going to talk about my art. It's just candy in the background. Um, so if I, but I do welcome any questions you may have. So if you see something and you'd like to ask me more questions, um, you can do it at the break. You can also do it right as your hand. So thank you so much. Um, I'm Seneca Cayuga Nation of Oklahoma. Uh, the Seneca and Cayuga are part of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Some people in the past have called us Iroquois. It's not our name, but you may have heard of us. It's mentioned in a lot of the um, history of the United States that we're Iroquois Confederacy. We are actually the Haudenosaunee. Um, so I teach a class called AI plus Art Science Fiction at the University of Florida. And in this class, we look at major advancements in the field of AI, starting with the very early computers like the Abacus, or Wampum uh, from my own tribe, or the Indian practice of Kipu, and the advanced Nabataean water architecture that was practiced during ancient times in the land that is now known as Jordan, as the first computational devices. We also look at how we use artificial intelligence in our daily lives, for our arts, for our storytelling, and in science. On the first day of my class in art, AI plus art slash science slash fiction, I ask my students to think of a powerful fictional narrative that they know that uses AI. Maybe their first encounter with science fiction, a video game, a movie, a show, or an article they read, really anything. And then after we've populated a big screen filled with all of their answers, we look at this in aggregate and I say, in which of these stories is AI the good guy? And which stories frame AI as a helper or something that's coded as positive? Only once in the two years that I've been teaching this class has a student suggested a book, um, but, and I'm sorry I don't remember the name, but she said in this book AI was evil at first. But then the humans taught it to have empathy, and then it could help people. So I ask them, if we can't even imagine a world where AI solved a problem rather than creating one, what is the creation story of AI? Why do we invest so much time, so much energy, and so much research dollars into it if we cannot imagine a way in which it's po a possible future might emerge where it helps us, or where it becomes something we use to make the world a better place? <clears throat> Why did we even think to create it in the first place? So clearly in our innovation centers, we hear many pitches for AI to help solve problems, to cure or diagnose illness, understand water data or ice caps, um, and look at ways in which we could help people to learn how to be more efficient or to be a co-creation tool for our creatives. But when we pull this out into the world of storytelling, we can see there is still a profound ambivalence surrounding the entire enterprise. It seems as though we still have a lot of anxiety, a type of anxiety that is more about how the world is unequal now, and how we imagine this tool, AI, would not be on our side, but on the side of a world that continues at a breakneck pace to become more unequal, this time with data. Our storytelling around AI is currently one to have several forms that I'm gonna let you know about my thoughts here. So I'll outline them briefly. There is, of course, the sort of Frankenstein narrative, which also echoes a kind of Faustian story or an Icarus story, which is a story about an irreverent curiosity and the hubris that causes us to pursue our own greed for knowledge beyond our human abilities. 
There's the common oracle framing in which AI is figured as a gateway to an unspecified divinity where we enter our little prompts, it queries some cosmic database beyond our mortal understanding, and then we just sort of read the chicken bones or, you know, whatever. Um, <clears throat> there's a famous Kurzweil singularity line, which in my opinion is a sort of Armageddon type of trope. I find this one kind of a snooze fest, but, you know, it's prevalent in this part of the world, so we got to acknowledge it. Um, we hear a lot of a thank you. We hear a lot of AI in a totalitarian post-truth context that borrows heavily from stories like 1984, Minority Report, Matrix, Psychopaths, uh, Terminator, maybe even Kafka's The Trial, in which machines impose a total yet impersonal domination on humankind. And finally, there's the Stockholm Syndrome version of totalitarian fantasy, which I just call "I want to be the machine." Um, um, this is the post-humanist ego talking, biohacky, always optimizing, self-maxing, and as dangerous as it may prove to be, this framing, in my opinion, is kind of silly and juvenile. It's like a little ubermensch fantasy, but it seems to have a lot of pull on occupied Ohlone land for some reason, so we also have to mention it. Um, <laughs> All of these stories are compelling in their way, and at least you know to certain communities, and they've gained purchase on our collective anima uh, imaginations in a way that will have real material consequences for the future of AI research, development, policy, and public adoption. However, they're not what I would consider to be creation stories. So what do I mean by this? So creation stories are important to all cultures because they embed values, scientific know-how, tools for future generations. Creation stories are a special kind of stories because they do not simply provide an account for why the world is the way it is. They also orient us towards possible futures that exist in accordance with our values as a society and produce a foundation upon which we can build a shared civilization. For instance, in the King James Bible, we have the famous lines, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So we have three clauses. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and word was God. And they already are set up an entirety of logocentric cosmology that will inform the entire course of Western civilization. The Western mode of understanding the world, writing, recording, delineating, are all contained in this very first sentence, like an oak in an acorn. It's incredible, right? The creation story of my people begins with a place called Skyworld. Like our satellites and oceanic tubes of the internet, it's a place to commune with those who are far away. In Skyworld, there's a woman, Skywoman, who falls towards our ocean and was saved by the creatures who live below. A muskrat, a beaver, turtle, and many others who make sure she has a soft landing on the back of the turtle shell. She brings with her sacred herbs and plants to make the world grow. She gives birth to twins, one who makes beauty and one who makes evil, one who creates the rose and the other the thorn. One creates clean rivers and one pollutes them. There are many creation stories as there are people, but if you study them and listen to storytellers recount them, you start to notice a certain family re resemblance between them, recurring motifs that connect them across desperate times and places. In our creation story, you can hear echoes of the so-called earth diver trope, in which a divine creature, animal or human, descends upon the earth from another realm. This narrative pattern, of course, and creation stories as far afield as Japan, Finland, West Africa, the Eurasian steep, and of course, North America. We also have in our story the trope of divine twins, which recur in several places in Western mythology, such as Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Jacob and Esau, as well as places like Romulus and Remus' story of the founding of Rome and elsewhere throughout ancient Eurasia. These similarities excite the imagination and curiosity, but the parallels that really demand our attention, in my opinion, are the structural similarities and the types of loads that they bear for the societies that tell them. The Haudenosaunee story is one that I know best, and it illustrates these principles very well. It contains wisdom about planting, seasons, herbs, agriculture, and our values connected to animals and nature. When we were once warring nations, this creation story in our DNA helped us to lay down our weapons and form a confederacy based on our great law of peace, coated with wampum shells. This law is sometimes referred to as the Gaia Nashinoga, the laws called a constitution, are divided into 117 articles. 
The United Haudenosaunee nations are symbolized by an eastern white pine tree called the Tree of Peace. Each, each nation or tribe plays a delineated role in the conduct of government. And we believe these events of this formation date back to the late 12th century, around 1190. This story survived. Forced removal from my ancestral lands in the Northeast Woodland area. Upstate New York is where I spent most of my time growing up. With other Haudenosaunee in the basin of many tribal reservations, my tribe was moved as part of the Trail of Tears to Oklahoma. And that is where my close family members live today. The first time I heard this creation story was at Strawberry Festival. I didn't hear the whole story in one sitting or even two. It was a very, very, very long story. And one that requires us to slow down and to celebrate the summer season, which we're entering now. Strawberry Festival is a time when we gather and play games and listen day after day to the way our world was made. So for me, when I revisit this story, I believe that there are a few lessons from it that we need to be a part of for my practice as an AI educator and artist. So the first one is, where does our knowledge come from? Like Sky Woman, we came from a connected tissue of the internet, which played a large role in the formation of the insight and information many of our models are now trained from. These were created and gathered without the consent of the communities who created these assets, words, images, and songs, so that must be acknowledged. Where did we come from? While much of the AI funding is still heavily in the world's superpowers, AI must be used as a tool to build an equitable world for peace and not to reinforce ancient colonial borders and to continue the process of colonization. Colonization is the tool that created our current water crisis and our climate change. To support the survival of our planet, we need AI to be on the side of a decolonized worldview. What plants and seeds are we giving this AI? So right now we're feeding these models images, texts, and connections, commerce, created on the internet, and of course the writing corpora of our books that have been scanned and digitized. But there are still many things that make us human. Our embodied intelligence, our bodily limitations, our values around truth and trustworthiness that are not yet adequately represented in what features can be extracted from us via observation. We have many ways of digitizing our daily lives, but we still are missing what Frank Jackson famously thought experiment of what does Mary, what Mary doesn't know. Um, so th for those who are unfamiliar with that thought experiment, Jackson imagines a scientist named Mary who's raised in a lab. It's a thought experiment, it's not true. Um, Mary, she knows everything there is to know about human sight, how to measure it, how to understand light, how our biology responds. She understands every sensor and computational way of understanding sight. Essentially, she's just a sight expert in all ways. But in her world, there is no color. She lives in a black and white lab and sees everything via the internet or cameras that are black and white. When she leaves the lab, what is it that she learns? When she sees the color red, what is the thing that she did not know before? Jackson calls this missing knowledge qualia. It is the actual experience, in this case, of seeing red. Our modern AI systems are sophisticated statistical and computational models that we try to develop in order to approximate qualia, but they do not have qualia. We're looking to define this experience, and it is vital that we can communicate what it is to be a person and our ways of knowing so that, what, that they are defendable, so we make sure that AI tools are helping to make our world better. And if we get this wrong, we risk not, not simply machines that are unable to match the epistemology of humans, we already have that, but actually a world in which we adopt a warped, lossy machine epistemology that flattens us into black and white and encourages us to devalue the qualia of our own sentience. What about those two twins, the divine twins? One who makes the world better, one who makes it worse. Well, there's of course a duality built into the way we discuss AI, which you can hear even in the tension between the two. AI has the ability to read the data points we are creating by the billions daily. Humans, we don't have this ability. An individual human could spend their entire life trying to interpret this vastness of data and they would die in failure. Because this disparity between human and machine computational power, it becomes difficult for us to understand the black box decisions that occur in the algorithms. Often experts in adjacent fields do not get to weigh in on the process before these new tools are rolled out. So, for example, in my talks, um, I often have people that ask me what the AI thinks about X, Y, Z, right? Or what the AI thinks about that. As if there's one AI. As if we've just jumped past this whole phase of experimentation, regulation, and, and, and arrived at a sentience where the one true AI speaks 
and we only listen and maybe provide commentary in hushed, reverent tones. Other times, people say that they enjoy co-creating with AI art generators because it's like collaborating with all artists in the world, except it's not. As someone who's done the very hard work of collaborating painfully sometimes with many artists, um, the joy of collaboration is not from me typing words and then stealing bits of art from others to make new eye collage, um, even if it has five fingers on each hand. Um, when you ask an AI generator to paint you a night sky, you'll likely see something found in the Western canon drawn back for you. Uh, when you ask chat GBT to write a poem, it rhymes in English. We're not co-creating with everyone, but with a particular worldview, as you mentioned. Um, the magic we could do is interpreted through this tool, which hides human workers, moderators, and presents us back something from scratch, but it was stolen. So we certainly have seen the way in which AI has been used to track people, suggesting continued bias in policing, uh, enforcement, and sentencing, and continued implement bias in hiring or lending or in other financial systems. So that's our present. But to look towards the future, I think we need to look at creation and the myth we wrap in it. For this new AI age, we need to think of a collective creation myth, a myth that does not cast AI as the aristocrats, making art and writing poetry and deciding our political destinies while we human, humans are left to toil in unsafe working conditions at nine to five jobs, earning a minimum wage that cannot keep us out of poverty. I work with AI because I do believe it is a great tool that can help us understand, simulate, and interrogate climate data in a way that can help us adjust to our climate crisis. I believe data and science storytelling need to move outside the walls of academia and newsrooms and into every area of expression so that we can hear climate stories unfiltered from those who are experiencing the climate crisis most acutely. We do not know yet what the creation story is for AI, but I hope that in the thoughts I have laid out today, we can begin to orient the conversations we have about this technology in a way that is strategic and truthful and appreciates the real stakes of the stories we tell. Thank you. It was fantastic, Amelia, thank you. Um, <clears throat> hi, everybody. Uh, hope you're all still awake, can sort of sit through a little bit longer. Uh, very happy to be here. Uh, thank you very much, Camille, for facilitating this, uh, and for Michelle for inviting me, and the rest of the organizers for taking good care of me, despite the fact I was kind of a pain in the ass. I didn't respond to emails and was late for everything. So I really appreciate your patience. Um, so. Um, I want to start by acknowledging that we're on uh, Mawekma Lone uh, land, um, and I appreciate the fact that I'm able to be here uh, on their territory and speak today. Um, so I'm going to do something that's actually a nice progression sort of throughout the day, and from Amelia, you really set me up well. Thank you very much. Um, I'm actually going to talk sort of about a project, not necessarily a, sort of an artwork necessarily. So um, hopefully, hopefully it fits and sort of will make sense. So um, the big green button, right? OK, so this is the title of my talk. That's who I am. Um, and we're going to start with this. So in uh, 2018, I co-wrote an essay called Making Kin with the Machines uh, that was in response to an, another essay by Joey Ito when he was the, the head of the MIT Media Lab um, uh, called Resisting Reduction, uh, where he was putting out a call uh, to particularly people working in AI to think more complexly about what they meant when they talked about uh, intelligence and what they meant when they talked about the human. Um, and then he invited people to, to uh, respond to his essay in the form of a competition. So um, I got together with uh, Noelana Arista, who uh, is a historian. She's Hawaiian, as am I. Um, she was at the University of Hawaii at the time. Archie Pachawis, who is a Cree performance artist who's been thinking about the intersection of indigenous uh, cultural practice and knowledge practice and, and digital technology for about 30 years now. And Suzanne Kite, who at the time was a PhD student working with me, um, and as of about a month ago was a doctor, so she's now finished. Um, so we we were interested in trying to think through what might it mean to approach artificial intelligence from indigenous perspectives. What 
could we bring to the conversation that we think uh, might enrich the general conversation, might help move the technology in a direction that was better for our communities, um, particularly in light of um, the, the numerous cases of uh, both data set and algorithmic bias that were sort of well known at that time, and of course it's only gotten worse. Um, and what we came down on to sort of talk about as kind of the first foray into that is sort of thinking through how our cultures have retained really rich languages and conceptual frameworks for having relationships with non-humans, right? So we write, we believe that indigenous epistemologies are much better at respectfully accommodating the non-human. We retain a sense of community that is articulated through complex kin networks anchored in specific territories, genealogies, and protocols. Ultimately, our goal is that we, as a species, figure out how to treat these new non-human kin respectfully and reciprocally. And then we, in the, in the rest of the article, we talk about what that looks like from a Kanaka Maoli, Hawaiian perspective, uh, from a Cree perspective, and a Lakota perspective. Uh, Suzanne is Lakota, I forgot to mention that. Sort of both identifying commonalities between these different nations, but also really digging into how we think about our relationships with non-humans differently. So really trying to present a very rich approach to how do we talk about something like AI? Right? How do we think about it as kin? What does that mean? What kind of responsibilities do we have towards it? Right? In the sort of the Western framework, which has done a really kind of violent separation um, and elevation of man above everything and all else, right? It's actually very difficult to have those conversations in a really, I think, deep and grounded way. Um, there are certainly people who try to do that um, and succeed in certain interesting ways, but I would argue that most of the indigenous philosophy I know of sort of kind of kicked those theoretical frameworks in the ass in terms of actually being really well grounded and well thought out and also backed up by thousands of years of experience. So, um, we did make a kin with machines. Uh, it was one of the contest winners and it kind of took off. Um, when we were doing it, we were like, this is weird, like this is like really coming out of left field um, from, from both perspectives, from, from the indigenous context, it's not the sort of thing that's often talked about, um, and then from sort of the artificial intelligence and kind of technology area, very little consideration of indigenous perspectives. So we didn't really think it was gonna get much traction. Turns out luckily and happily we were wrong. Um, and so we thought, okay, whoa. So we just sort of put this thing out there where we're sort of talking about indigenous perspectives. We should get more indigenous people involved in this conversation, right? To see if we're just crazy or we're off base or if we're misrepresenting our cultures, et cetera. So um, we did the Indigenous Protocol and Artificial Intelligence uh, workshops um, in 2019. So these are two workshops that were held in Honolulu. Uh, we brought together 35 participants from uh, North America, the Pacific, Australia, and New Zealand, uh, mainly Indigenous, uh, but not all Indigenous. Um, and from a very wide set of backgrounds. So we brought, we did have AI engineers and neuroscientists working with AI, but we also had like um, uh, indigenous uh, knowledge holders and language keepers. We had historians and linguists and lots and lots of artists involved in the conversation because we're like, you know, AI is definitely a question that requires a holistic approach. We can't really isolate different aspects of it and hope to really make progress. So we brought everybody together for three days um, and um, turns out that we weren't totally crazy, or at least the other people who were as crazy as we are, um, found lots of interesting things to talk about, um, as well as the differences. And then about 12 of us came back in, the, in May um, and did a 10-week writing residency. And um, everything was sort of kind of built around this idea of like, how can we help influence the development of AI and eventually build AI ourselves in a way where there's a deep integration between our cultural protocols and the protocols determining how AI operates, right? And so, you know, one of the reasons it was such a lovely setup uh, for Amelia to come and, you know, and, and talk about what she did um, is, you know, it gives you a taste of how those protocols might be different from sort of what is just considered to be the status quo default background out of which these technologies are being made presently. 
So we produced a position paper in July of 2020. Um, encourage you to go download it, it's free. Um, if you go to indigenousai.net uh, position paper, you'll find it. Um, and so that's 14 long form original contributions that came out of the workshops and then we have 18 sort of blog posts, two or three page blog posts. So it gives you a really wide sort of range of views on this question from people coming from about 15, 16 different indigenous, uh, indigenous nations. And, um, uh, and there's everything from like kind of, you know, publication ready journal articles to poetry, to visual artwork, to descriptions of how, um, uh, how to make the technology. So I'm just gonna, since this is a sort of art context that we're talking about, so I'm gonna talk about, pull out a couple of the, the art um, uh, sort of probes that were in the position paper. So this is by Suzanne Kite, uh, How to Build Anything Ethically. This is an essay where she sits down and thinks through the process, the protocol that her people, the Lakota, employ when they're building a sweat lodge. So starting with how do they gather the materials? Right, and how do they talk to the materials? Like, how do they talk to each other as they're building it? What are the different sort of um, uh, gestures that they need to go through to show respect, et cetera? How to kind of take that and transpose that into thinking about how do we go about um, uh, building AI systems? So starting with the minerals in the ground that get pulled out of the ground in order to make the hardware, and then going all the way up the stack and thinking about how all those things might be done differently if they were done within a protocol of reciprocity and care. Um, this is one of the uh, art sort of um, imaginaries, uh, Chai Chardon by Michelle Brown, um, who was a PhD student at the time at the University of Hawaii. And so she's speaking from a Basque perspective and sort of really thinking through, okay, how could AI be really useful for my community, which is a um, really oriented towards the ocean, right? And really oriented towards eels, very central to that culture. So what would it mean to create an AI that helps them tend to the ocean around them and particularly the eel population that's around them. So building it into this form factor, this goes out, it sort of basically kind of like does an assessment of what's going on, counts the eel, sort of like samples the water, does all this work to sort of understand the health of the ocean ecology and then comes back. And actually it sort of slides inside of your arm and rests there and like gives you the data. Um, so this is a, a piece that I was working on uh, called Quartet. So thinking through what, what does it mean, what would it mean to be raised as a young Hawaiian um, where you were raised alongside three different AI. So one that was built from a Kanaka perspective, so a native Hawaiian perspective, one from a Blackfoot inspired perspective, uh, which I don't have time to go in here, but that's from Leroy Little Bear, which I really recommend that you go take a look at. But he talks about how the Blackfoot language sort of really kind of constructs a world that's not about objects, but about flow and about energy flows. And then an octopus-inspired AI. So really thinking about what would it mean to have a very highly distributed neuronal system that was helping you process these really massive amounts of data. Uh, and then um, this is a little bit different. This is the prototype piece where we actually, in that final week, a group uh, actually got together and prototyped a, a Hawaiian language translation app. And really what they did is they focusing on what does it mean to collect the data to do something like that in an ethical manner? And what does it mean to do it in a way that the community can validate the information there, right? So Hawaiian, like many sparse languages, right? Sort of not many speakers, not a lot of Hawaiian language on the, um, on the web to be, to be stolen. Um, and so um, uh, very challenging to do natural language processing on through machine learning techniques. And even when you do, oftentimes it gets things wrong. So what does it mean to actually create a Hawaiian translation app that Hawaiians actually think is good and can stand behind and thinks reflects the ways in which they use the language? So uh, we also, there's a, there's, we, we were like, okay, how many people are gonna read all 200 pages? So there's a three page guidelines for indigenous centered AI that kind of try to condense everything down into something that's a little bit more, a little bit more digestible. So you can go take a look at that for an overview of the thing. So we got out of that, um, got the position paper published. And we're like, okay, so making kid with machines sort of kind of identifies a, a sort of an interesting place to explore. The um, indigenous protocol and AI workshops and position papers sort of kind of staked out some positions within that space. What now, right? 
And so for me and um, uh, you know some other people in the group, it was like, okay, well now we got to figure out if we can actually like activate this. Can we actually go about designing and then prototyping um, AI systems that are from a Kanaka Maui perspective or a Mohawk perspective or Lakota perspective? What does that actually mean? Is this all just conceptual and it doesn't really matter when it actually hits the hardware, right, and the software, or can we actually make a difference? So we. Um, started, we started Abundant Intelligence. The conversations about it started about two years ago. Um, and, uh, and we wrote grants for two years and uh, we're now funded. Um, and so officially started on March 1st. So, um, so we're right at the beginning. This is all like what we're gonna do, not what we have done. So Abundant Intelligences mobilizes an indigenous-led, indigenous-majority, international and interdisciplinary team of experts coalesced in locally rooted pods to collaborate with indigenous communities and learn from and with their knowledge holders to bring novel perspectives to transforming AI. Utilizing an international network of indigenous-centered research labs as our home bases and partnering with world-class AI research, or research organizations, our goal is to advance methods for improving AI to better serve everybody through exploring and developing culturally grounded AI systems that support indigenous ways of knowing. Whew, that's a lot. I'm going to unpack that a little bit over the next couple of slides. Okay, so uh, first of all, this is uh, our international interdisciplinary team. Part of what I love about this is that we have everybody from uh, neuroscientists to data governance people to historians to linguists uh, to uh, visual artists and performance artists, um, uh, indigenous language keepers and knowledge holders. Like it's a really amazingly interdisciplinary team of people um, with many people that are like operating at the top of their game in their respective fields. So it's a super exciting group of people to be involved with. I still can't believe we managed to get them to come together with us. Um, uh, this is, I realize, oh, it's a little bit easier to see up here. It's almost impossible to see right there. Um, and the quality's not that great. Um, sorry about that. So um, one of the challenges for doing sort of large scale research where you're trying to enact indigenous methodologies is that a lot of, you know, indigenous methodologies really emphasize the local, right? And being grounded in particular communities. So how do you do an international sort of research effort when you stay, when, but still stay local like that. So we're using this system which we call pods. Um, and so pods are located, um, are located um, sort of adjacent to or in particular indigenous communities um, and um, are going to work from that community perspective as we carry out this, this work. They're also located in indigenous um, media labs or le media labs that have an indigenous focus um, and um, sort of are kind of already have relationships with the community that they're operating with. So the first three pods, uh, there's one based in Oteroa, um, um, there's another one based in, in Hawaii, and then the third one is based uh, around Lethbridge um, in Alberta. So the Maori community, Hawaiian uh, Kanaka Moli community, and up in Lethbridge, that's the Blackfoot community. Um, and then we plan on, this is a six year project at the moment, we plan on adding at least three more pods uh, as we go along. Um, and the idea is that the pods are where we bring together sort of Western knowledge systems and the particular knowledge, the system, knowledge systems of that particular community, figure out if we can get them engaged productively in conversation with each other, and then figure out if we can then use that to inform how we want to think about designing these technologies. Uh, so that just shows you sort of where we are at the moment, sort of spread all over the place. Um, and um, had to put a lot of thought with such an interdisciplinary team and also, again, trying to actually do well-grounded work with indigenous communities from the academy is really hard. Even though the majority of us are indigenous folks um, and the majority of us have been doing research in and with our communities for decades, it's still a really big challenge. So how do we sort of go about meeting that challenge? So the grant um, or the project is divided into these, these, these sort of top three sections. So the first one is uh, called integrations, which is literally the first two years so we're just talking to each other, figuring out how to talk to each other. It's like, you know, what's your epistemology like? What is your methodology? How do you go about generating knowledge? How is knowledge validated within your community? Right? How is it carried? Who's responsible for it? How is it articulated? What are the practices, right? 
Um, and then the second two years is called Imaginaries, right? Um, so a lot of the work I've been doing for the last 15 years is around uh, future imaginaries for indigenous communities, thinking about what kind of futures we want. So the Imaginaries two years is, so we go from there to like, okay, we think we can talk to each other and we've found some productive points of intersection. Let's now sit and imagine what kind of AI we want, right? Not the kind that we're being given, Right, but what is it that we want? Where do we think this could be really helpful for our communities? And then the final two years is called the intelligences um, axis. And that's really where we get to, we sort of take ideas from those first four years and are like, okay, we're gonna try to create a language app based on these models. We're gonna work on uh, um, climate change uh, within the Hawaiian Islands based on some of the conversations that come out, have come out of this. Um, and then there's a huge training component. So that's the bottom circle. Uh, so we've um, committed to a crazy number of what in Canada is called HQP, HQP highly qualified personnel. I think it's 400 over the, the six years, which um, is kind of a crazy number regardless, but we want the majority of them to be indigenous uh, students, um, but also indigenous people from the community. So one of the arguments we made in the grant applications was we need to use some of this money to train people who are not in the formal education system because there's lots of people who have lots of really important knowledge within our communities that don't, aren't in the system, don't have a PhD, right, but have huge, vast areas of expertise and knowledge contained within them, and so we need to be able to support them as we're uh, working on this, and also help train them so that they can engage with these technologies in a really uh, substantial way. Um, so, yeah, I got to, okay, these, this is going to be fast, I'm sorry, because we don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to go through this quickly. How are we going to do this? So first, we've got to understand indigenous knowledge frameworks from the community's perspective. For the most part, I would say that probably 90% of what most people in this room probably understand about indigenous knowledges comes from white people writing about indigenous people. Okay, and most of it's bullshit, right? So it's about how do we, know, how do we understand it from within the community, how the community talks about it. Okay, imagine how those frameworks might be integrated with computational methods. This is a hard problem. Like how do you take a story like the creation story, right, which contains all this data, right, about the territory, about the people, about governance, about how to behave, all these sorts of things. How do you, how do you integrate that into the sorts of ways that knowledge must be represented within computational systems. And that's also this next, this next question. Like, how do we formalize that knowledge? And how do we do it in a way that's respectful and not violent to where the knowledge is coming from? Uh, and then we develop data sets, models, and algorithms that integrate that knowledge properly with computational methods. We then implement it, prototype, test, iterate. And then this is really key, then we integrate it. So how do we integrate it into community practices, right? How do we not just sort of boom, drop it onto the community, right, and be like, this thing's super cool and it's gonna help you do X, Y, and Z, right, but it doesn't become part of their cultural practices, of their knowledge practices. So this is gonna be a really interesting component as well. And then just really quickly, the, the first five areas that we're gonna work on. So for me, I've been doing interdisciplinary research for a very long time, bridging, bridging art and technology and cultural practice. And I know by now that in order for efforts like this to be productive and to be sustained, everybody at the table has to have a research, has to have research questions that they're invested in. They can't just be there for representational issues. They can't be there because they feel guilty, right? They can't, there's all sorts of reasons why people come to the table initially that they, they, don't, they won't last unless you have questions that everybody has a stake in. So, Language, expand the range of lingu linguistic structures and language densities that NLP systems can robustly and appropriately handle. Storytelling, develop technologies that allow for robust and diverse user interaction and agency. And more robust contextualized machine understandings of the stories humans tell to articulate knowledge. Environment, explore how traditional indigenous territory stewardship practices can inform AI-driven land management and restoration systems. Multi-agent systems, develop robust approaches to diverse agents. Uh, oh, that's right, I, there's still an error on this slide. Develop robust approaches uh, where diverse agents might interact in specific social cultural contexts, including modeling of human and non-human actors. 
um, and social neuro, meet, uh, modeling how humans draw on their social cultural context to learn and make decisions, and how situated social cultural intelligences can be modeled into AI systems. So, um, and then one of the big things is uh, starting in the summer of 2025, we're gonna do these summer institutes for indigenous AI, uh, where we're gonna bring, we're hoping probably a cohort of 20 um, uh, uh, emerging indigenous uh, AI sort of researchers uh, to Mila uh, in Montreal uh, to learn more about machine learning and AI from some of the world's experts. Um, and um, that's it. Thank you, mahalo. Oh yeah, I have a lot of money for postdocs, so if you know of anybody that wants to come do this work, let me know, okay. Thank you so much, thank you so much. Jason and Amelia, absolutely tremendous, and I know you all have a tough challenge of reconciling Cartesian time and space with <laughs> multiple epistemologies, so shall we press on, or how do you want to? Okay. Lauren, uh, would, you, would you like to react? Would you like me to go first? Oh, go first, yeah. Go ahead. I, well, I just, I mean, just first of all, deep thanks. I think that um, so much of what happened in the first half of today brilliantly teed up this conversation, including the bridge question at, at the last panel. And um, I, I think both of you, Jason and Amelia, uplifted something I think about all the time, which is technology just and always amplifies and accelerates the consciousness wielding it. So we have to go upstream, especially in an era of exponential tech, and really attend to the quality and the consequences of the consciousness wielding it. And we have many, many, many choices for that. And we have many opportunities to shift, alter, expand our consciousness from what I think, Jason, you referred to as a sort of status quo default background out of which a lot of these technologies are being developed in the main. And I think, Amelia, you uh, addressed a lot of that as well in terms of there are lots of ways of knowing and we sort of uplift one. Um, and I guess the, a question I want to ask you is really about the sacred. Where does the sacred fall into this? Um, in a post-enlightenment world, so much of today's technologies are coming out of an aggressively secular, kind of on purpose, fields of the academy and industry. And what is, I think, even, their, in, even in their pluralism, indigenous worldviews like the Hindu cosmology I was raised in has an inextricable, <laughs> we've desegregated the sacred from all of these other spheres of life. And it, that changes consciousness and that changes consequences. So I guess you're in the academy, you're each operating in these spheres. Is this, uh, is this become a question for you? Is it a limitation? Is it, in your, is it implicit, explicit? Um, does it figure in? I've been talking, like, you, oh. you go. <laughs> well, you know, I think probably the most sacred thing that I do in my daily practice when it comes to AI is um, teaching. You know, the connection that uh, we have to the next generation and the responsibility that we have to steward them safely uh, as they build the world that will be the world for seven generations to come is really important, and I don't take that lightly. And I think the second thing is um, the, commun uh, the community I have with nature, right? I build a community with nature, both um, to think about how to protect it, but also to learn deeply from that deep voice. I recently returned, and I apologize for how jet-lagged I am today, but from um, the lands that are currently known as Jordan in the Wadi Rum Desert and the Dead Sea, which is the you know, lowest place in the earth. And I think we discussed this the other night that you begin to hear that voice. And would you like to share that, qu that quote that you shared with me yesterday? From Stephen Nachmanovich in a beautiful piece he wrote about improvisation in life. And he said, daring to listen to the voice within and deeper still the voice within the earth. And the Dead Sea we've both gotten to go to is the lowest place on earth. Yeah. And you, I mean, that hearing and understanding that voice is so important to what it means to be on this planet, alive and, and connected so deeply. Um, and, and that is something that, that that qualia, as I mentioned in my talk, is really missing from a lot of the ways in which we understand why we should create technology, not just what it's used for after we create it, but why we create. Um, and without that deep connection, um, we're really limited in our worldview, and we're really limiting the next seven generations of what type of world we will leave for them. 
So I don't deal with the sacred uh, in the work that we do, um, not because it's not important, not because it's not central, um, but part of the work that we do is about how do, so th there's, there, is a, there is a very powerful pull, cultural pull, to sort of, you know, we all get placed into different kinds of boxes based on stereotypes, right? And so one of the stereotypes that indigenous people often get placed to, right, is the sacred. So we have a connection to the land and we understand the sacredness of it and da da da. All that's true, but oftentimes that becomes a really hard box. And part of the work that we do is to say, okay, that is absolutely true, but there's actually a bunch of just knowledge we have, right? Just information about the territories that we live on, um, practices about how to live together well, all sorts of things that are not sacred, right? They're just good ideas for how to live as human beings on the planet, right? And also there's scientific knowledge in there, right? And so how to reconstruct some of that into the language of, the language that is legible to uh, Western scientific frameworks, to uh, Western funders, to the academy, et cetera, without losing the important things about it, I think is one of the challenges that we kind of constantly come back to is how do we get people to, you know, because for me, part of what happens when people put us into that sacred box is they're also putting us in the past, right? They're also saying, oh, you have wisdom, right? That's based on the past, right? And part of what we're saying is like, we have knowledge that's super useful now. Right? And there's actually some things that we're knowledgeable about that we're more knowledgeable than you are, right? You tried to eradicate it, you tried to overwrite it, and now like, you know, my, my wife, Skawanati, you know, who's Haudenosaunee, um, and she does artwork around Sky Woman, you know, and you know, she's fairly well known, she gives talks, and inevitably somebody stands up. She's just talked about, she does machinima, and all this sort of modern art practice and stuff like that. Somebody stands up and they're like, basically like, oh, how can your knowledge help us save the planet, right? And she's like, that's not what I'm talking about, right? I'm talking about my art practice, and then the last time she did happen, she was like, you know what? <laughs> we tried to tell you, you didn't listen, it's your problem, <laughs> right? I mean, she was being facetious, but I think it's important, it's, a, it's always a political project. Right? That's one of the things about coming in to the academy or places like Stanford or something like that. There's always a political, there's a struggle to position your capabilities and your knowledge in the ways that you want it to be seen and that your community values. Because there's such an impetus from the outside world to put you in a certain kind of boxes that inevitably are about diminishing you and about, particularly with indigenous people, making it possible for people to feel good about the fact that they took our land, so. Thanks, Jen. Um, yeah, I'm really struck by the way that you both uh, work with so many different people and are really intentional about incorporating a lot of different viewpoints. And I think it's, it's clear there's not like one indigenous viewpoint or each of you is not representing all of your culture and, and knowledge that you're reaching out to different people. And I'm wondering, um, what have you learned? I mean, Amelia, you also spoke to, like, it's not always easy to, to collaborate. Um, so what have you learned through these collaborations? And do you think that there's things that you've learned in the dynamics of working with people that feed into your thoughts about how we might work with AI or how AI could work? Can I go first? Go. No. Okay. So I, I currently have a, a new art collective called Talk To Me About Water. And we're a group of um, data scientists, artists, machine learning scientists. Um, my sister is part of it, and like me, she's Seneca Cayuga, and also the head of water data publication at the USGS. Um, so we have you know, a very diverse group of members. And I, I was trying to think of a way in which we could move and be in the world, and we had we're really excited to travel the world after being in, in quarantine. We decided that we would make work um, that would be site specific, that we would travel places together and commune and look at people in the face and talk to them. Um, we're, we're called Talk To Me About Water because we think about and tell stories about the global water crisis. Um, members of our group are from, you know, 
uh, what is formerly or what is currently known as Jordan, they're Bedouin, and their water story is um, their water present will be our water present soon, and their water stories will be all of our water stories soon. And so, in many ways, they're bringing messages from the future to other parts of the world. And we, as Indigenous people, are doing the same. We're experiencing the water crisis most acutely here in the United States, and we're able to tell those stories. Um, not as cautionary tales, but saying this is our, our current present, and if people understand and see that, that's data that they may be missing to understand their own water story. So we're looking at, at asking people to think about their water stories, and the best way that I could think of the container that we're in is I think of us like a band. So we go and we, we do gigs, and we perform at museums and educational institutions, um, sometimes in the Redwoods, sometimes in Wadi Rum Desert, uh, soon to be on Governor's Island in New York um, on June 16th. And we, we perform music from our culture, we tell the water stories that we have, um, and oftentimes the key insight that we're bringing in our water stories is how water has been used as a tool of oppression. And it still is. And so that I think there's a, um, there can be a tendency to be very overwhelmed with climate anxiety. And there's also a way in which we can think that it's an individual person's problem if you just wash your hands for three seconds less a day that this will solve our global water crisis as if it's something neutral that's happening to everyone equally rather than a tactic of oppression, which is the way it is currently being used and will be unfortunately, again, in the future. So this is something that I encourage all of you to think about is your own water story. And I think it has changed the way that I collaborate um, with AI because I'm looking at the ways in which um, we can share these water stories, we can understand water data, but also help um, those who are experiencing the water crisis most acutely to have access to data that can help them um, make decisions around their daily lives rather than extracting their stories and telling them for them, if that makes sense. So, um, number one, feed people. <laughs> like, it sounds really basic, um, but also if you know anything about, well, certainly institutions and in, academic institutions in Canada, like when I started doing research, and uh, not doing research, academic research in the 2000s, like we couldn't get, we couldn't pay for a feast, right? That was like, that's not part of the research, right? That's not part of what you're supposed to be doing, right? That's not knowledge production, right? And so we had to fight you know, at various different levels, all the way up to the granting agencies, to be like, no, like if you want to do research with indigenous communities, you need to be in a relationship with them, and a big part of being in a relationship with them is sharing food, right? Um, and um, this is also my, again, my wife Skawanati, who's been the partner with me with, and through all this stuff. Um, you know, from the very beginning, she's very serious about food, right? Um, very serious about, you know, three times, boom, boom, boom. Whereas I don't care, like I'm like, it's fuel, fuel, I'll get to it or something like that. But luckily she won out the day. And so from the very beginning, we've always found ways to pay for food. We've always come in and said, look, this is part of our research practice, right? Is to convene people around the table, around meals, in the cultural center, to feed them, et cetera, like that. Um, and it just provides a place where everybody can come together where they're doing the same thing, right? That's really important to them. Uh, and, um, but the, and then the other thing is, um, uh, I always feel kind of a little bit silly because they all sound so simple, but they're actually really quite hard to do in our kind of current systems, which is, um, as I said, the first two years of the grant um, of, the, of the program is listening to each other and talking to each other. And that was hard to get through too. Like we got questioned at the interview stage about that. It's like, there doesn't seem to be a lot going on in this first two years, and we're gonna give you a lot of money, like what is gonna be happening during that time? And we're like, no, we need the time to sit together, to eat together, to play together, to get to know each other so we can build trust that the communities that we're working with can have a confidence that we're there for bigger reasons than just advancing our career, for instance. Um, um, and so that we can begin to under, people can begin to understand what is important to each other. Right, so what is important to me as, say, a Kanaka Mali person is actually not the same thing that's necessarily important to me as an academic, right? Um, you know, that's not the same thing necessarily as an artist, right? And so how do we go about communicating that to each other? Um, like, what is important so that we can do work that helps all of us move forward on the things that are important to us? Yeah. 
Thank you. And I so wish we could take questions both on and offline. But in the interest of time, I want to make sure we have plenty of time for our, last, for our next panel, too. I want to thank our panelists all. Thank you.